Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for this MDA Engaged Community Webinar on Relationships. Having connections with others is an important piece of everyday life. Building relationships and having people around us helps to increase a person's overall well-being. My name is Michelle Barrios and I am the Community Education Specialist at MDA. We are thrilled to have you join us today for this important and educational webinar. The webinar today is part of our larger MDA Engage flagship community event series, which focuses on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and social opportunities. Be sure to visit the MDA Engage section on mda.org for updates on upcoming virtual education events. We are recording today's event and we'll be posting it to the mda.org website for on-demand viewing to ensure that those who are not able to join us live today are able to access this information. Please know that all phone lines have been muted. We will be having a question and answer session towards the webinar. Please be sure to utilize the Q&A window to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of webinar icons will appear. Click on the Q&A bubble to open the window and enter your question. You do not need to wait until the Q&A session to chat in your questions. As questions come up along the webinar, please feel free to send those in. Before we begin, I would like to say thank you to our speaker and panelists whom you, whom you will meet shortly. Let's review the objectives for today's webinar. Attendees will learn how having a neuromuscular disease affects social relationships, discover how to make social connections for friendships, discuss dating with a neuromuscular disease, and hear about online resources for friendships and dating connections. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker. Paige Limbeck is a pediatric psychologist and assistant clinical professor at the Yale Child Study Center. She provides therapy and assessment services within the general outpatient clinic and within several neurology specialty clinics, including the multidisciplinary muscular dystrophy clinic. Her clinical and research interests include pain management and issues related to adjustment to illness and grief and loss. Prior to coming to Yale, Paige completed her internship and doctoral fel fellowship at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, where she provided services to youth with cancer and other catastrophic diseases. Before then, she received her doctorate in school psychology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And with that, I would like to turn over the webinar to Paige. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle, for that kind introduction. Just give me one moment and I'll share my screen. Okay, and I'm assuming that everybody can see this. Um, thank you again for having me today. Um, as Michelle said, I am a psychologist who works closely with the muscular dystrophy community and I'd like to add to the introduction that I am by no means an expert in the sense that I have not lived with muscular dystrophy personally. Um, so even though I'll be speaking to these topics from a professional lens, of course all of you in the audience are much more intimately familiar with going through life um, with a form of muscular dystrophy or you have a loved one um, or somebody close to you who's um, experienced different diseases in the muscular dystrophy umbrella. Um, so I just like to put that caveat out there and that's why I'm happy that at the end of um, my portion there will be opportunity for questions and more discussion. Just to reiterate the agenda, I do hope to start by discussing factors that not only can be at risk for hindering relationships, but also those that are associated with resilience and establishing stronger relationships. 
Of course, relationships are very challenging, even if you do not have a chronic illness. Um, so we'll be talking about the challenges that are specific to muscular dystrophy and both romantic relationships and friendships and peer relationships in general. I hope to outline practical strategies that can help anybody promote a positive relationship regardless of circumstance. And then finally, I will be sharing not an exhaustive list of online and community resources, but some that could be helpful to all of you in the audience. Of course, before we think about relationships specifically, it's helpful to think about something called health-related quality of life. And this relates very closely to something that we call the biopsychosocial model of health. We know that there's different layers of health that are both related to physical health and one's medical condition and also mental health as well. So you can see in the diagram to the right that there's biological within person factors such as the disability itself, perhaps a genetic predisposition, IQ, somebody's personality or temperament and so forth. And those overlap with psychological factors too, such as the strength of one's social skills at baseline, somebody's self-esteem, how well their coping mechanisms are, a part of them and developed. And then on top of that, and this is what the arrow is pointing to, we have these social factors too. So what's going on in the environment in terms of peer support, of course, what's happening within the family system, which is arguably some of the closest connections we have in life, especially since birth. Um, and then those that exist in other environments like school, church, the wider community, and any other context that you might be a part of. So again, just to summarize this slide, we know that these, these factors layer on top of one another, they play off of each other, and they influence one another. Um, so as we're hoping to promote your quality of life in general, we're thinking of all of these areas as being influencers to what can drive healthy relationships and healthy well being. A different way of looking at this is just to consider the bi directional relationship between health related quality of life and relationships. What this diagram shows very simply is that those who have a stronger, more positive health-related quality of life, so those who have these strong coping skills and are optimistic and are living fulfilling lives despite a medical condition or despite muscular dystrophy, tend to unsurprisingly have stronger relationships. Additionally, those who have really strong social supports, strong friendships, and maybe even um, support from a romantic partner and family, of course, that would predict a more positive health-related quality of life. So we hope to strengthen both of these areas, and that's what this talk will focus on today. So let's take a quick poll. And for this, I'm not asking you to type anything or write anything down. I simply want you to reflect. And this exercise is often helpful when we're setting new goals or we're just thinking about a starting point for intervention with anything. So there'll be two slides focused on this. And for this one, you'll see a ruler at the bottom. I, I like to refer to this as the readiness ruler. It's used for lots of different interventions in the field of psychology. Um, and I didn't make up that term. It's actually called the readiness ruler. And you'll see the phrase or question at the bottom, which says, on a scale from 1 to 10, with 10 being the most important to you, how important is it to you to have fulfilling relationships in your life? So just ponder that for a second. Choose a number in your mind. Again, I'm not asking you to share. And just think about where you fall on level of importance that relationships have for you in general. Now, this could be any, this could be relationships in general or a specific kind of relationship. It doesn't really matter. So once you've honed in on your number, take note of that 
And you can even think for a second in your mind, perhaps why did you not pick a number one or two below that? So to offer a concrete example, if I chose the number seven in my head, I could then ask myself, well, why, why did I put it at a seven and not a five? And just take a second to answer that question privately in your mind, and then I'll move on to the next step. Okay, and even if you're still thinking, that's okay. For the next part, it's a very similar yet slightly different question. Same readiness ruler is being used. On a scale from one to 10, with 10 being the most confident that you feel about anything, how confident are you in your ability to make and keep fulfilling relationships? And it goes without saying that this may be the same number that you chose on the previous slide, or it might be one that's lower or higher. So just hold in mind what this number is for your level of confidence in making and keeping fulfilling relationships. And that's broadly defined on purpose. So hold that for a second. And if you have a number, similarly, reflect on why you chose the number that you did. So if you chose a low number, why did you choose that and not something higher? Or you can even go the other way. If you chose a higher number, why did you not pick something lower? Okay. Thank you all. I know this was not a time, of course, where I'm collecting responses. Um, given the size of our audience. But the reason why I find this exercise helpful for people is I don't think it's ever helpful to make an assumption that everybody co who comes to a webinar like this has very high confidence or stresses the importance of social relationships. I know in the muscular dystrophy clinic in which I work, for some of our for some of our young adults and kids, there's very high motivation and they find it extremely important to fill their social circle. Um, for others, it's less of a priority. Similarly, um, confidence level in approaching others, in maintaining friendships and demonstrating strong social skills, that can also vary drastically. Um, and, and these levels of readiness are not specific to the muscular dystrophy population. This is for anybody in life. Um, so I like to start with that is just be mindful of where your starting points are as you, as you think about your relationships moving forward. Overall, and this is really speaking to the broader literature, um, the consensus seems to be, and I think this is supported by anecdotal evidence that I've gathered from the patients um, who I work with, it seems like there's, of course, a desire for social connection. We are human beings who seek and um, get great fulfillment from social relationships. So, of course, people with muscular dystrophies similarly want these relationships, but sometimes view them as not possible for various reasons or harder to attain for various reasons, which I'll get into. Um, and even though some studies report that there's just more challenging social relationships or a higher prevalence of social problems, that's not the case globally. So, there's conflicting research that also shows people with muscular dystrophy are certainly capable and have great relationships in their lives. So again, even though more challenges might be present, we also know for a fact that um, there's plenty of factors that um, make these relationships very successful too, and that lends to a lot of hope as we're thinking about improving anybody's circumstance in this domain. And as I stated in the beginning of this talk, it's just a fact that relationships are extremely complex, even when a muscular dystrophy or an illness is not involved. So where even though this adds to the complexity, it, it doesn't mean that if you are physically in perfect health that you get off scot-free or 
you have no challenges whatsoever. It just might be more of an uphill battle if you have something like a muscular dystrophy. This is a brief overview, not an all-inclusive list, but a brief overview of some of the potential relationship hurdles. You'll see a theme through my slides that I often include the word potential or possible because this does not mean that these things are necessarily present. They're just at a higher likelihood to occur, perhaps. Um, we know depending on the disease or the muscular dystrophy in particular, there could be a higher need to rely on caregivers um, or other people such as a parent or a family member or even a nurse in some circumstances um, that require somebody to more consistently be around you and helping. Of course, when we think about you as a young adult, getting out and doing more independently with peers or a romantic partner, it is unsurprising that that would complicate the picture quite a bit. So that reliance on others can pose challenges, especially when um, people are really eager to be on their own and then they're left in a situation where that caregiver might not always be present and then somebody with muscular dystrophy might be needing to advocate for a friend or somebody who does not fill that formal caregiving role, they might be recruiting them to help with things. Um, and people have different comfort levels with that, making those requests. Um, similarly, people on the receiving end of those requests have different comfort levels with delivering and participating in that care. So that reliance on others can complicate the relationship picture and it can be a hurdle. And we'll talk about ways that that could be navigated in a little bit. Of course, for anybody with muscular dystrophy or frankly, any human in general, um, the emotional functioning plays a big role in relationships. I, I've just listed a few of the many um, potentials here. So um, it, there's something we call internalizing symptoms that references anxiety and depression, fear of rejection. Um, and if you have a muscular dystrophy or especially one that's more progressive in nature, there can absolutely be a fear of or uncertainty about the future and what that future will look like. So one's emotional functioning and the feelings they possess, of course, translate to how they behave and how they present themselves in social situations. Um, I always make the comparison, if somebody is happy and portraying a lot of positivity, for example, they're kind of like one of those lights that you put outside that attract bugs. It's like people gravitate towards that energy. So, the opposite would be if somebody is quite depressed and withdrawn or highly anxious, they're just less likely to attract other people um, to be approachable in that way. Um, so emotional health and, and addressing any difficult emotions that are chronically present can absolutely um, affect social relationships. And we know that <clears throat> people with chronic illness in general are more likely to have emotional challenges just because it's very difficult to have a chronic condition of any kind. Um, not guaranteed, but just at higher risk. And then there's other social factors. Now I'm on the third line. Um, certain types of muscular dystrophies are associated um, with just less strong social skills in general. Um, for example, Duchenne muscular dystrophy often is associated with autism. Um, so sometimes, depending on the type, um, we just know that there can be a higher, a higher incidence of these other issues that make relationships hard. And then I think for any physical or mental health condition, there's always concern about stigma, teasing, how are people going to treat me? Um, tends to be most common in middle school and that early adolescent period. And at the same time, we, we know 
as a society, there's ongoing issues with discrimination and things like that. Um, so that's something for us to hold in mind as a potential barrier. And then lastly, a lot of people within our clinic and also within the research cite practical barriers. Um, for example, things that should be as simple as navigation of a physical environment, or if you're in a wheelchair, will I be able to access that setting? Will I be able to get into that building? Will I be able to go to my friend's house? How will I use the bathroom somewhere? So physical access is a very real hurdle that needs to be thought about and overcome too. And I'll be curious when we move towards our Q&A, if there's others that are missing from this list, then we can of course discuss them because this was just a, a smattering. I wanted to outline here, and I, I know this is kind of a busier slide, I wanted to outline what can happen in terms of this relationship between how we think and how we act and our feelings and how that can impact our approach to a social situation too. This is called a cognitive behavioral model um, and it's used a lot in therapy and it's used a lot when people are discussing um, when people are discussing anxiety about relationships or even depressed mood. And I'll kind of walk you through, but the simple takeaway here is there's a bi-directional relationship among all of these constructs. So you'll see the arrows pointing every which way. That That is because these things feed off of each other. So for example, we have kind of a situation up top um, and if that situation is you're invited to a party, for example, and maybe depending on somebody's life experience, if there's a thought that comes up like, well, they won't understand my muscular dystrophy, it's not worth my time to go, we can expect that that might trigger certain emotions. So that might lead to feelings of sadness, or maybe you'd even feel bored, or you would anticipate feelings of disappointment. Um, you know, we, we assume that there wouldn't be positive emotions that go with that prior thought. So if we're feeling that way, then what might one do? One might be more likely to stay home, play video games. I mean, I think there would be a lot less motivation to go check out that party because you're having negative thoughts and you're having negative emotions about it. So you'll stay home. Um, and then that could lead to uncomfortable body sensations as well. It might contribute to fatigue because you're feeling kind of sad and down and you're bored, perhaps even pain or muscle tension because of emotional stress that you're under. And then the cycle goes round and round. So I bring this up in the context of relationships because it's important to monitor our thinking and our expectations too. I always say to my patients, the goal is not to lie to yourself. We're not going to be like, oh, this is going to go awesome, and I'm going to be the most popular kid at this party or this event. Um, it's good to be realistic, but it's also important to challenge your thinking to ensure that you're thinking helpful thoughts of like, okay, well, maybe maybe at least one person could understand, or even if it doesn't go great, maybe that was a good use of my time because it was good practice for me. So again, your thoughts play a powerful role. And I think in any muscular dystrophy situation, um, you know, there can be a little bit of, of the thoughts get there a little quicker, um, perhaps. So it could be the thoughts get a little more negative and, and we get on this negative loop. Um, not always, but some of the time. So that leads to um, us beginning to think about strategies and we have this upfront information. Now, how can we get ourselves on a good path and a good groove for making and keeping relationships? Now this slide has a little best friends bracelet, but I'm gonna be talking both about friendships and dating and romantic relationships. This is just a summary slide. I'll be going through each of these step-by-step and again, these are helpful not only for making friendships, but I think a lot of these tips apply for romantic relationships as well. 
So the number one tip, and I referenced this previously as a potential barrier, is first it's important just to tackle any barriers to physical accessibility and to think through the logistics of how could you access these environments. And if you have access to somebody like a social worker, they, their involvement may or may not be relevant here, depending on your family's resources and how you're set up in terms of transportation and equipment and things like that, if you even need it for your type of muscular dystrophy. But thinking about, again, the logistics of how are you gonna get there? Is it possible to access the places that you want to? And is there anything that's present as a restriction that needs to be broken down or addressed. And then in terms of caregiving, what assistance will you or your loved one require once you're there? Um, it might take, for example, a little upfront conversation or planning um, to figure out these details of things like if you need medicines available or, you know, perhaps, um, you know, you're able to kind of walk with support, but you'll need more frequent breaks, or maybe you have a wheelchair that needs to get somewhere. Um, so I, I think this is where the problem solving becomes really important. And it doesn't mean that these things aren't possible. Um, but practically, sometimes we need more upfront notice. And I know this could be really frustrating to people who just want to go when they're motivated to go. Um, and this might, depending on how this thought process unfolds and how the problem solving unfolds, it might be a circumstance that you as the person who is motivated to do something social needs to take the lead on where that's to take place and when, if the ball is in, in your court, you might have more control over those things. So this was a very practical thing to tackle as you're thinking about strengthening relationships with others. I'm sure this slide is one that may be familiar and hopefully is familiar to many of you. When you're establishing new relationships with anybody, a great place to start is just what is of interest to you personally. And I put some pictures to represent things like church or adaptive sports or social media or going to college or your own high school or school, vocational rehab or working, video games I know are very popular, especially among my, my muscular dystrophy patients. Um, of course, you're more likely to meet people with similar interests if you're doing something that's of interest to you at first. Um, and this is not a complete list. Of course, there's other things like volunteer opportunities. There's tons of community events out there. And it also comes down to personal preference. I know that some people that I've worked with, they really get involved in their specific disease community. Um, so my patients with SMA, some of them are hooked into the SMA community. Others are hooked into the Duchenne community. I mean, you name it, depending on the disease. Um, and, and others prefer to separate themselves from that. I mean, that is one part of who they are, but it's certainly not their defining part. Like others just want to kind of compartmentalize that and that there's no right answer. It's whatever feels comfortable to you and wherever um, you, um, wherever you feel like um, you'd be most comfortable meeting people. Um, the and this is the part where it's common sense but worth repeating i mean we know that in order to make friends and meet people you do have to get out there in some capacity even if that getting out there means you're doing so through social media or the internet i mean as long as safety considerations are being are being thought about um that's definitely an avenue um in working in the muscular dystrophy clinic where I am at Yale, I think sometimes it's, it seems that people are kind of waiting for the friendships to magically appear when they, they do require effort, and that can be a scary thing that, that I'll talk about. Um, so yes, pursuing your own interests, and there's plenty of resources that outline those that I'll get into too. 
Um, in relation to pursuing your own interest, there's another term that I think is helpful to think about in this area called behavioral activation. Um, it basically means that not only does this have a potential social benefit, but it also can help fight against depression. If you're just engaging in enjoyable activities, either in or outside the house, if you have a structure to your day, if you're getting out in the world, you're, must, you're much more likely just to be a generally happier person, and that can contribute positively to increased social supports and stronger social skills. And these things kind of feed on each other in a positive way. That's why I've included the spiral here because it leads to personal growth. Um, so again, even if it's something that doesn't seem like a big deal to do, um, but it, it helps you get out there a little bit, then that's, that's good. Um, I didn't put it on this slide, but what also relates here is momentum, like small steps can lead to bigger changes, both with social growth and personal and emotional growth too. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. I find for a third idea, it's helpful to think about something called the best version of yourself and your relationships. I included the link on this slide. It brings you to an exercise that's pretty spelled out that I've simply summarized here. It's different than the first one we did to, together today, but ideally what you would do is you would reflect on your best version of you and your relationships and really breaking that down into specifics. So for example, you would be thinking about what exactly would you be doing? So if you had a good friend, what would you be talking about? How would you be communicating with that person? What would your face look like? What kinds of words would you be saying? What would your conversation be about? Even things like how would you be feeling as a person in that relationship? And then are there particular aspects of you, whether that be your appearance or certain qualities that you would want to put forth, that you would want others to see? And what's helpful about thinking through this in detail, either by writing it down or saying it, al saying it aloud or tape recording it or just summarizing it in your mind is that a, that makes it easier for one to actually set a goal and do those things because if you're very concrete about it then you can be like okay i can go and i can recreate that in real life um, so i encourage you to really think about what would your best self be like and if you had a mirror and somebody was seeing that you know how would they be responding to what you're putting out there into the world. And I think, again, this is not specific to muscular dystrophy. This is helpful to anybody who is hoping to improve their social situation. Another thing that is very relevant for those with muscular dystrophy and those with chronic illness when they're working to strengthen relationships is this idea of reducing avoidance. Um, there's often a ton of fear or negative expectations about what to expect from relationships. Um, and it can, in some cases, cause people to feel pretty hopeless and, and feel like, well, this is not really worth doing. So often I encourage people and my patients included to take small steps to um, to tackle the issue. So it's tackling the avoidance, but not in a way that's completely overwhelming. So we're not going to like shove you off the deep end and say, okay, go to the busiest party and just get in there. I mean, that we, we want to pick small achievable goals that can lead to bigger goals. But the idea and the kind of the magic word here is exposure. Um, and what exposure means is you're facing the fear. So I included this kind of silly comic to the right. It says, Professor Gallagher and his controversial technique of simultaneously confronting the fear of heights, snakes, and the dark. 
So even though that's an extreme example, we do know if there's social anxiety, if there's avoidance of doing social things because of negative expectations or negative thoughts, we do know the treatment is to actually not avoid and do it, but we can do that in a really methodological um, or methodical, I meant to say, like small steps to um, build upon smaller gains. Um, so to offer a concrete example of that, um, you know, if, if you're wanting to make a friend or do something a little more social and you're nervous about it, what would a first step be? What would, what would something small be that you think you could do? And maybe that's something like, okay, I'm just going to have a conversation with someone today. And then you can challenge yourself more once those smaller steps are accomplished. Um, another example that comes to mind is I'll talk to my patients about like, I mean, this was easier pre-COVID, but now I think it's becoming possible again. Um, I would talk to my patients about like, you know, can you see a movie with a friend? Because that involves a lot less conversation. I mean, can you do something kind of with someone that doesn't require a lot of conversation if that's a point of anxiety for someone? Um, so think about what your baby steps would be and work up to larger goals. That would be my advice on that. And then if some of these earlier tips are not working for whatever reason, it's totally fine and encouraged to seek out professionals. There's people who are happy to help with this. Um, I am a psychologist. I see plenty of patients, both young and older, where this is their primary reason for coming to treatment. It's like, I haven't quite figured out this friendship thing, or I have some friends and I want more or whatever it is, especially if there's an issue like anxiety or depression or some other emotional or behavioral reason that's getting in the way. Um, I think many therapists are more than willing to help with that. Um, there's also other formal supports like social skills groups. Um, sometimes it's nice to go to a group where there's certain targets for social skills that are being addressed um, and practiced in a, in a context where other people are doing the same thing. If you decide to pursue that, then I would also consider make sure that you're also um, spending time with people who are not working on social skills so you can see um, kind of what you're working towards. Um, it's nice to have some other models and examples around you too. Um, if there's a speech issue or some other type of communication issue, that's what speech therapists are great at. And then there's even things like dating coaches out there. I mean, there's many services that are really designed to help people be successful. Um, so on that note, um, before speaking about dating, um, I just want to share some resources that have been helpful with the friendship topic specifically. Um, and I know MDA, of course, has a great website where they not only have events like this, but they have information about community events and camps and um, other ways to engage families. Um, oftentimes, the nice thing about that is um, people are um, fighting similar battles and, and navigating similar challenges. So sometimes finding people who can relate to what you're going through is, is really nice. Um, and that's the nice thing about the PPMD as well. Um, so I'd encourage you, if you haven't already, to pursue just going through these websites and seeing what local events might be out there. Um, if you're wanting some more like specific direct guidance. I like this book. It's called The Science of Making Friends. Even if a caregiver reads it or if you want to read it personally, um, they have some really nice advice. And um, this person who wrote it is a psychologist. So um, I think that's a nice resource as well. And again, even though these are kind of the how-to resources, if you will, some of the most helpful things are the things I referenced on that earlier slide with the pictures, like what's of interest to you? Um, what activities do you want to do? Even if it's a one-time activity, um, how can you fill up your calendar a little bit and access the things that you really enjoy, which go beyond some of these 
more formal resources, I think. So moving on, I know that was some upfront knowledge about friendships and relationships in general. I just wanted to share just a little bit of information about dating in particular. Again, this list is not meant to be all inclusive. Um, just these are things that my patients have talked about and things that often come up in the research about common, uh, common trouble spots. Um, many people with muscular dystrophy, when it, they think about dating, there's of course a similar concern about how will I be accepted or perhaps not accepted by others who I'm trying to form a relationship with. Um, we know the wider media as a whole sets a really impossible standard for physical appearance and how you present yourself and what you look like regardless of what gender you are. Um, so for people with muscular dystrophy who may or may not have um, a condition that makes them look physically different or puts them in a wheelchair or whatever it is, um, poor body image can really happen and that that can um, make it challenging to feel good about dating. Um, for people who are thinking about marriage or having children, there can be concern about passing down a type of muscular dystrophy or a disease. Um, some people, for many reasons, might just have limited experience with dating and are uncertain how to start with it. I already spoke about caregiving needs and roles. I mean, it's super awkward to have to think about going on a date with somebody who needs to assist you with various things if that's relevant to your circumstance. So navigating that and thinking about what would the role of the person that you end up dating or perhaps even marrying, you know, what would they be responsible for and what could you be independent for in managing your muscular dystrophy. And then like anybody, uncertainty about the future and what's to come and um, kind of what is your muscular dystrophy going to throw at you next. Um, I think those are concerns that um, unfortunately come up quite a bit. Um, we do know, again, not my intention here is certainly not to paint a bleak picture um, because we do know that there's multiple factors that are associated with resilience and handling really tough situations. And people have kind of figured out that those things often relate to finding ways to be independent and communicating clearly and appropriately. Unsurprisingly, having strong social support, being engaged in social activities, these things are broadly linked to resilience and living a happy, fulfilling life, even with muscular dystrophy. So I think those are things to build off of when you're thinking about dating and, and romance as well. I liked this quote that I pulled actually from a qualitative study. Um, I think it captures some of the reality that could be um, present when it comes to dating with a medical condition. Um, this person said, I think that sometimes it's a matter of letting your guard down and at other times keeping your guard up. So you don't get hurt by what people say to you, but sometimes you also have to let your guard down so you can get to know new people. So this person is recognizing um, the help that can come with something called a social tactic. Um, and a social tactic is basically a strategy for protecting yourself emotionally, a strategy for um, deciding what aspects of your disease you want to be known to other people, because there might be many aspects that you don't feel comfortable sharing off the bat or that you hope to keep private forever. So this person is talking about how they've strategically guarded themselves, they've strategically you know, kept to themselves at certain times and other times really understood that you have to put yourself forward to be able to connect with other people. So I, I liked that quote and that balance. Um, and as you move forward with your personal journey, think about that for yourself um, and maybe even consult with others informally with others that you trust about you know, okay, what should I say in that circumstance? Or when is the time that you kind of choose to strategically 
not go there with a certain topic or you know is there a little white lie that could be told to protect yourself emotionally um so i, I think these these social tactics um are something that are unique to every person um some people's way of navigating the social world they kind of found a good trick for and that same trick might not work for somebody else um, I know I'm being a bit vague, so an example that's used is some people kind of use humor quite a bit, and for others, that's just not their style. So I think considering what would feel right to you and what you could present in a genuine way is really important. Um, I also want to say, as you're thinking about dating, definitely consider your own readiness. I think as a society, there's such an emphasis on like, oh, you've hit a certain age, you know, or you've finished college, time to, time to settle down and meet someone. Um, and we know there's plenty of other factors that could make somebody just want to wait longer or maybe not want to date at all, and that's fine. So, um, so definitely, you know, pursue dating at a time that feels right to you if if you want to pursue it at all. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, something that can come up quite a bit is, especially among medical teams, um, certain providers are great about asking about um, people's interest in um, social relationships and dating, and others are not great about bringing up those conversations, especially when it comes to things like sexual health and um, aspects of muscular dystrophy that, that could affect things like that. So don't be afraid to ask your medical doctor if you could talk privately with him or her to ask some of those questions. Um, it's, um, again, some are great about it and others are not. Um, it's totally appropriate to ask for some time alone, even with a parent or a caregiver outside the room to learn more. And it's good for people on your team to know that you're interested in, in pursuing dating and, and growing your social world. Again, problem solving with caregivers in your own life, if necessary. I know there's probably also caregivers and parents on this webinar today. So also think about how you can um, be someone who encourages and sets up circumstances for your, your child or loved one to, um, to get out there in the world. Um, Sometimes it's tough to like set limits and be like, okay, you got to do something social, but sometimes that can be a really powerful support when there's reluctance around that. Um, and then, of course, think of ways to communicate openly. Um, I, I think I've thought with some patients about kind of having a brief explanation ready, like, anticipating what questions could people ask me and, and what do I want to say for these tougher questions that I might get asked if I'm on a date or meeting somebody new. Um, I always think it's helpful if you have good friends or people in your life that um, you think are a little more skilled in the dating arena. Um, don't be ashamed to ask for advice if there are um, things that they've done that have been successful um, and certain like strategies that have worked well that you want to adopt, by all means, try it out. Um, and then consider trying different contexts. Um, I know online dating is becoming more and more popular. Um, I mean, there's, there's websites, and, and this would not be a good fit for everybody, but for some, um, they have created websites that are more geared towards people with disabilities. Um, and again, that might be comfortable to some and not to others. So just know that that's an option. And then um, if dating is something you've been trying and it's a struggle, continue also simultaneously to try to keep widening your peer group and of course pursuing one's own happiness. That's only going to make you more attractive to people in general. Um, so those are still good goals to strive towards. And, that, and then I think this is good advice to anybody, regardless of whether you have muscular dystrophy or not. Um, of course, trying doing your best to set realistic expectations. Um, I, I know this is not a very clinical way of saying this, but like there are jerks out there. There are people who are going to say inappropriate things and 
um, you know, discriminate. And I, I think as much as we can kind of know that that could happen and then persist in spite of those negative experiences, knowing that there's also really good people out there, um, you know, that persistence is, is really key if you're hoping to meet the right person. Um, again, this is, I'm by no means a um, psychologist who's an expert in dating, but I think from speaking to my patients and uh, being pretty familiar with the literature, these are the themes that come out. Um, there's some really nice um, resources out there. Um, Easter Seals has tons of blogs and articles on um, just living with a disability and trying to find love and dating. Um, I really liked some of their resources. Um, and this guy, um, the dating coach on wheels, uh, has a pretty hilarious website, which I was not showing for this webinar because there's some um, choice language on there that would not be appropriate, but um, I, he seems to be a pretty like real individual who has some practical advice as well. Um, and then there's other blogs and dating websites just out there in the world. I think this is, um, as I was preparing for this webinar, it, it seems like it could be helpful to um, read about other people's experiences and to hear, um, to hear how other people have approached this, similar to this Engage talk today. Um, and then I like this quote um, by a social psychologist that I think relates closely to um, this talk today and about making connections. Um, don't fake it till you make it, fake it till you become it. And this really speaks to how it can be helpful to put your best self forward. And um, I'm confident that that could put you on a good path to meeting some of the most important people um, in your corner. So thank you very much for having me. And I think we'll turn it over to Michelle and the Q&A if I'm right about that. Thank you so much, Paige. Yes, um, before we turn it over to the Q&A portion, I would like to introduce um, our panelists for today. Um, so Sky and Robbie have taken today to join the webinar, um, a little bit about themselves and answer some questions uh, from our attendees. Uh, Sky and Robbie, if you wanna turn on your cameras and unmute. Um, I will start off with Sky. Do you want to um, say hi and tell us a little bit about yourself? Party at all side. Party at all side. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So my name is Sky. I live in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and I've been volunteering with NPA for the past five years and was actually the North Carolina State Ambassador for NPA in 2019. On my daily life, I teach and watch my 10 and five year old nephews. And then after that, I have turned my love of art and creating um, into a small side business. So that keeps me pretty busy as well. And a personal interest I have is hockey. So now my team season is out. So I guess I have to wait till next season. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Robbie, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Um, so my name's uh, Robbie Reed. Uh, sorry, my there we go. <laughs> my, I think my video uh, tripped out there for a second. Uh, so I live in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I've been involved with NBA uh, for. Uh, I was thinking about today. I got diagnosed when I was eight, so you can do the math. Twenty-two years now. Um, and, uh, in my personal life, um, I'm married actually that recently got married, uh, a year ago. That's my beautiful wife there. Um, and I work for a an additional nonprofit. I work for a place called ability Crew 60 here in Phoenix. Um, we have an adaptive sports gym for people of all abilities to be able to work out. Um, in my free time, I love to play wheelchair basketball. Um, I actually, I also coach. Uh, wheelchair basketball. Um, I've been doing that for a long time, and I'm a huge Suns fan. I'm really happy the Suns are doing well in the playoffs. I'm hoping for uh, 
us to keep going forward. And um, I'm looking forward to giving you guys some input and answering your questions. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Robbie. Um, like I previously mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, if you hover towards the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A bubble. Click on the bubble and type in your questions. As those questions start coming in, let me stop my share so we can all see each other here. Um, do you guys, uh, Robbie and Sky, do you want to share a little bit about, you know, making connections throughout your life, both friendship-wise and dating-wise? You want to go Can first, go guy? First? <laughs> no, you go ahead. first. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Did you say, what was that? I said you can go first. Okay. All right. Um, uh, so for me, um, I, like I said, I got diagnosed when I was eight. Um, my form of muscular dystrophy is a little bit more uh, slow progressing. Um, so I was able to walk for a while and then um, into those middle school years um, is actually when I started using a chair. Uh, primarily um, a wheelchair and um, for anyone I think that you know kind of being different than anyone else or everyone else is hard um, but those teenage years it can be really difficult and um, I think a lot of people on this call can probably relate to it's hard to make connections um, I know uh, doctor uh, had talked about um, how <clears throat> you know a friendship takes work um, and it's it's hard you know when you're young and you're going through those teenage years, you kind of feel like you're the only person and, and that's okay. Um, but it can make it difficult and you do have to make that extra effort. And for me, um, I really didn't start to make those bonds and, and friendships until I was, uh, you know, in my later teen years and really into adulthood, um, as I kind of became, <clears throat> you know, my own person and, and had experiences. And I'm sure a lot of individuals involved with MDA, you probably went to MDA camp. That was a huge thing for me as well. Um, that's really where I learned how to make friendships. And um, I've had, I have friendships from there for, um, you know, I've had friends for a long time now through um, the, um, through camp and that helped me do that. And then if you throw into the aspect of dating, <clears throat> um, dating was, was difficult for me because I was kind of a shy guy. Um, and I really didn't start dating until I was in my, uh, my mid twenties. Um, was when I kind of had my, my, uh, I guess you call it waking as far as being able to really start to have those um, relationships and start doing that. Um, and so, I mean, that's kind of my experience, you know, it's all about progression. Some people are, are faster in, in making relationships and friendships and other people, it takes a while. Um, and you know, it, the biggest thing is just not to get discouraged. Um, and it takes time. I mean, People used to tell me all the time, it'll get better as you get older. And you, in the moment, you're like, no, you, you don't understand. It sucks. But then, you know, here I am now as a 30 year old man. And I can say that's definitely the truth. <laughs> um, so that's kind of my, my experience in, in all of that. You want to share a little bit, Sky? So I was diagnosed about the same age as you, Robbie. Um, but I hit it. For a long time. So I didn't tell anybody in my close circle of friends that I had muscular dystrophy until it was actually visible. And I started walking differently. So that I didn't, I didn't grow a lot going to NDA camp. I didn't grow a lot being um, around anybody like me. And I think that me like um, sheltering myself, I guess, from experiencing people similar to myself, I think that um, made me feel a lot more alone than I could have been. And so then, um, I, I don't, okay, where was I going with that? <laughs> so now, okay, now I'm going through a transition where I'm starting to use a wheelchair. And I am semi-newly single, so I've been in a relationship for the past six years, and when I first started dating, I was different than what I am now. So figuring out the whole dating scene in a new body has been a new experience for me, and I think that being confident and having my own personal interests 
I think has helped me a lot because like uh, the quote that Paige had shared where you kind of have a wall up so you don't let others hurt what they say about you, but you also lay your wall down a little bit so you can actually get to know someone. That holds very true to me because I feel like I don't let anybody's opinion on myself affect my opinion of myself, whether that be good or bad. So if someone's like, oh, you look so beautiful today and I feel like crap, I'm not going to believe them. And if I feel really like I'm doing a great job feeling confident and someone's like, well, you, you walk weird, then it's just like, so I don't care what you think. So um, I think for me, the way that I've been able to keep um, in maintain relationships has just been, whether that be friendship or romantic, has just been being more open um, about how I'm feeling, about like, I don't feel like comfortable going into if there's like a place with, um, so for me, like that's our big issue going into like a building with deep sets, like my friends know, okay, let's go to a different place. Like, so I, so I've talked to them about that. So I don't have to say it every time, but, um, I think that just being open, vulnerable, it actually will surprise you how people respond. It's not always negative. Uh, Paige, do you see um, that happening with the young adults that you see in the clinic um, that they might be able to hide their um, neuromuscular disease diagnosis because maybe they're still walking? Um, do, do you see them trying to do that? Yeah, yes, I, <laughs> I do. And I, I, there's a couple patients who come to mind and it's, I, I mean, I think the examples that come to mind are kids who have enough knowledge that for their particular types of muscular dystrophies, unfortunately, they are progressive. So they're anticipating, okay, I can kind of like get away with this now. And how am I, how am I going to navigate it when it becomes more noticeable, especially with things like I have a couple of patients who are really actively involved on a sports team, which is great for social support, of course. And then, and then if their performance is being hindered, even though there's great things out there like adaptive sports, it's hard, it's hard to make that leap. Um, of course, of course, it's natural to want to stay doing something that you've been doing previously. Um, yeah, I think Sky, I liked that. I liked a lot of what you said. And I liked your final comment about like the negative expectation seems to be very, very strong in a lot of circumstances. And I, I sadly hear about situations where like, it's for good reason that it's been there. And then I hear of other situations where it's like, oh, I like explained that to somebody and they didn't seem to be care as much as I thought they were going to care about it. So I, I hear both of that. Thanks, Paige. I know you mentioned a little bit about adaptive sports and we do have a question that's come in, but right before I get to it, um, Robbie, I know that you work in adaptive sports. Have you seen that? Do you have experience of someone who has been, you know, able to do, you know, just regular sports and now has to transition into adaptive um, sports? Have you seen that before? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in my own experience, um, you know, I, I started playing, uh, you know, from one side of the spectrum, like adaptive sports are a huge catalyst for a lot of people. You know, for me, that really kind of changed my life as far as, you know, being around individuals who were, you know, doing what I love to do, which is play basketball, but also living an adult life. You know, I, there were times in my life when I was young where I was like, I'm, ne I'm in a wheelchair. I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to be able to do this. I'm never going to do that. And then I started playing and, and I, I met these adults who were married, had kids, were working full time, you know, and I realized, okay, you know, I'm not the only person here. Um, 
but as far as, you know, I always will encourage people to try adaptive sports, even if they're hesitant um, or if they're like, I don't really like sports because there are plenty of people I've met over the years that, that were not sports people at one point, And then they started playing an adaptive sport and it really kind of pushed them in a situation that, you know, has, you know, helped them significantly because it's a community, you know, I, I, I've learned uh, so much from people that I've played sports with as well as, uh, you know, I'm able to do that now as an adult and pass that kind of on in the same sense. You know, I, the, I learned how to drive a car from somebody that I played basketball with, you know, I learned how to transfer in and out of my car. Um, but I've also learned life experiences. Um, but there's so many different adaptive sports, no matter what your ability level is, there's something that, that you can do. Um, and majority of communities in the country have that. Um, you know, I'm very blessed here in Phoenix and blessed where I work, where we pretty much offer anything you can think of. Um, but, you know, I didn't find wheelchair basketball until I was 15. And I have kids that have found wheelchair basketball at age six or seven. And if I had found it at that point in my life, it would have been, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be telling you a different story at this point. Um, and so that's why I always encourage it. But also to circle back on um, what Dr. Um, Page has said, uh, it's not always for everybody. You know, sports aren't for everybody and that's okay. But I always encourage people to find some sort of outlet because it does help you with the only So um, whether you have a disability or not. So, I mean, adapt sports, there's so many positives. Um, and I've seen it, you know, I see kids, you know, starting at eight or nine, breaking out of their shells, you know, they barely want to talk to me as their coach. And then two or three years down the road, you know, they're, I can't get them to shut up or, you know, circle into 10 years and I'm sending them off to college to play wheels or basketball. So, I mean, it's, it, it's definitely a, a great, a great, I'll always push that. <laughs> Thanks, Robbie. I wanted to get to our question that we had from an attendee. It's, uh, a long question, so if the panelists want to take a look, if you press the cue enable, you'll be able to see it out loud. Um, it says, I often experience fear and anxiety from having had scary physical and psychological crisis where I was alone and medical interventions put me in great danger. Cell shock that resulted put a distress, distress, this trust of others in me that still affects my relationship with friends and family. Do I have to push through or should I seek help from a professional who is unbiased? Well, because there is a stigma in my family culture against seeking help from mental health professionals. I've also gotten anxious about the general stigma and looking down upon a disability and people with them in society. I've experienced mothers hurrying their children away when they want to ask me a question and people visibly avoiding me in public. It's I just move, should I just forgive them and move on? Uh, could Dr. Page and Michelle share some of their experience in relationship? Okay, I have a long question. Uh, let's get to the first part, which I think Paige, you might be able to answer. Um, should he push through um, or seek professional help um, from someone who is unbiased? Yeah, so I, I first want to say um, thank you so much for the thoughtful question. And I think it's a really brave question to ask too, especially, um, especially since I'm, and I'm sure hopefully this answer will benefit others because I think this is not an uncommon situation. Um, broadly, I would say if anxiety is ever getting in the way where it's causing a lot of distress or if it's keeping you from being able to access a part of your life that's important, like if the avoidance is pretty strong where you're not able to do things you want to because of your anxiety, I think that's a big indicator that treatment should, should be sought. Um, I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying that it's hard when a family is not supportive of that. Um, and I guess, you know, if, if you're an adult, if you're 18 or older, you it on your own without somebody's, without somebody needing to like sign a consent form on your behalf, like you can do it by yourself. Um, because of COVID, um, I think 
psychology services are accessible, pretty accessible now because of things like Zoom and a lot of people are doing teletherapy, which is nice. Um, and I don't know, hear, hearing your question and hearing the added difficulty of experiencing the stigma, I, I almost never say like, ah, hold off on the therapy. Of course, I'm a little biased because it's what I do, but I think, you know, that sounds distressing and to have additional support going through that and thinking about this, even if it's just for an assessment to, to learn like, hey, how much of anxiety is a problem here? Um, I think it's absolutely worth it. And again, it, I think my threshold is low for encouraging people to go talk to someone, um, especially because it's just hard to have a chronic condition, period. Um, and then I think a second part of the question was about my relationship experiences. I, I think I can answer that pretty briefly. Um, again, I, I can't speak to what it's like to, to have friendships and romantic relationships as a person with muscular dystrophy, but I, I've been involved in, in various activities and sports and have had my fair share of ups and downs in the dating world. And I, I think those are very like relatable experiences to anybody. Um, yeah. Thanks, Paige. Uh, I, and I know that there are, you know, you don't have to technically, especially in this time, um, go see somebody live and in person. There are like web apps that I've seen, um, like texting apps that I've seen where you can talk to a counselor, or psychologist. So I know that if, I mean, if you're trying to hide it, I would say that's one of the ways that could, that I could. Yeah. Yeah. And also just to add quickly, also talking to your primary care provider, or if you have a trusted specialist that you see for your muscular dystrophy, like sometimes there's easy access to like a social worker in the clinic or somebody who has that mental health training who could help you think about this. Um, and I think PCPs are like good place and primary care providers like your main medical doctor are good places to start as well. And also I, I like what you said, Michelle, that there's lots of ways to access this now. Yeah, before I get to the uh, next question, you know, I'm in the same boat as Paige, though, uh, as someone who isn't diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease, I've definitely seen my fair share of heartbreak and love in friendships and relationships. So, I mean, we're all in the same boat trying to find, you know, connections with people and, and, and connections, and love connections. So, I mean, we're all trying our best out here. <laughs> Uh, let me get to the second part of that question, which um, I'll move this to, to, to Robbie and, and Sky um, about, um, you know, the stigma and um, let me go back to it just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, mothers hurrying their children away um, or the stigma of, of having a disability. He says it's hard, um, but should he forgive them and just move on? So can you share? Uh, do you have any insight to that that we can share? Um, um uh, I guess I'll go first, I guess. <laughs> um, and then Sky, if you want to chime in too, feel free. Uh, so I would say in my own experience, um, I've always felt like, uh, like I wanted to help help that person kind of understand. So if a if like a mom kind of Hold there because it, it's a common it's a common experience for all of us you know if you have a disability you can go anywhere people are you, you're noticeable you know and you're gonna unfortunately you have to deal with people you know looking at you and maybe asking questions you know behind your back to a sense to a certain sense um but i found what helps me is to just be open and honest you know if, if a child is interested or is curious you know and the mom the mom says something or kind of pulls them away, I'll be like, oh, you know, I, I just, my muscles don't grow the same as yours. So I use this thing to kind of get around, um, but it's okay. You know, I get to do all kinds of stuff and, um, but that can be hard too. You know, when I was younger, I didn't want to do that. You know, I felt like it, it was kind of invasive and it made me uncomfortable um, and that's okay too. Um, but the one thing I would say as far as like forgiving them is if it's truly impacting you to the point of where it you know it's having an effect on you in a negative way then i would say 
you know, work towards a, a point where you can forgive them or just kind of let it go because you don't want that to happen. It's unfortunately something that's always going to happen no matter what we do. And you can choose to, you know, kind of have an impact or if you don't want to, that's okay as well. But don't let that, you know, affect you and, and, and rule your life because it is what it is. You know, people are going to say and do what they want to do. Um, but you know, it, it doesn't matter, you know, and, and, um, it don't let that, that affect you to the point where you're going to be, you know, angry or frustrated or anything like that, because it, it is what it is, you know, and, and, and don't worry about what other people think. And I know that's easier to say than do, and anyone will struggle with that comment, you know, whether you are a person with muscular dystrophy or a person, uh, who has a disability or does not have a disability it's difficult, but that's, that's really what I would say is, is just try not to let it affect you or, you know, rule your life because it can really put you in a, a path of like being really mad about the fact that, you know, you have these daily struggles and you don't want that. Like, especially with, it's a person that you're just barely seeing or a person that you're barely interacting with. It, it is, I would, so I would say to answer your question, yes, I would forgive them or just don't even let it bother you. Hi, do you have anything to share? Um, I agree with Roddy completely. I feel the same way, and I've experienced what Michael is saying, so I can relate to what you're saying. Um, and my mindset is very similar, so I, I think changing your perspective and maybe thinking, well, they're doing this because they are curious or they don't understand, like, I'm not trying to say this in a negative way, but they're like, ignorant on what is going on so instead of taking it like personally just think that it's something that they haven't really been um exposed to and so i think like roddy said just not paying it any mind like just live your life and something that i do when i because i still get in this way where i hear the whispers behind me and it starts bothering me something that I think to myself is that this is my day. I'm going to go and do what I want to do. And if they want to spend their time talking about me, then they're wasting their time. So I think you should just, I think like if you could just move on or change your perspective and not take it so serious um, personally, then I think it would really help you. Thank you, Sky. We have another question that has come in. Um, are there friendship or, or are friendship apps a good option to meet people? Are there any recommended ones? Paige, do you know of any? I, so one, I, I don't know if this is an app form and I meant to mention it, but I know that some people I know have had good luck with the meetups app. Um, and I think there's like many, many interests that are within that. Um, so that's one that immediately came to mind. Again, I don't know if it's an app. Um, yes. <laughs> Rob, your sky, do you know of any? Um, so, uh, I think the, the friendship apps are something that's kind of become like a newer thing in the last couple of years. I could be wrong. Um, but I think that especially with the world we live in and the pandemic and everything, there's a lot of options out there. Um, <clears throat> now I can't tell you I have experience in the friendship side, but I will tell you that, um, believe it or not, how I met my wife was on Tinder. Um, I know that Tinder kind of gets a bad rap sometimes or whatever. Um, but, uh, in the midst of my single life dating and everything, it was a great way to kind of meet people. Um, but, uh, you know, I met my wife, uh, via the internet or whatever. And I tell people too, like, this is a thing. Sometimes people are like, oh, that's great. And other people are like, oh, that's kind of weird. And it's like, but if I told you I met my wife in a bar, you wouldn't say that. Right. So, but when you talk to somebody online, that's a perfect way to get to know them because you have to talk to them and get them to a point where they're comfortable to meet you or vice versa before you have that personal interaction. And so <clears throat> I would say that those apps and things like that are, I mean, I know for me for dating, that was a great way for me to start because it was, it's, it's nerve wracking to get to know someone or just to go up to someone and say, hi, my name's, you know, Robbie, how do I, you know, 
you seem like a cool person like it's kind of awkward but in that situation if you're just texting that person that's a great way to get started and just kind of having a, a, a conversation and then eventually maybe you do become friends so i would definitely encourage it. i think that's a great way if you're having a hard time meeting people i go for it and so for me i think um another another option is on facebook they have a lot of um groups so like i'm going to empty i'm going to group specifically for the form of muscular dystrophy that I have. And I've met a lot of people that way and I've become friends with them. And it's, a, it's an easy friendship because they really understand like what I'm going through. I understand what they're going through. And then we don't really have to, like if, if um, we're going through something, we just have someone to rely on and not have to feel like we have to explain it from point A, because they already know that. Um, so I think that has helped me a lot, making friends that way. Um, but I don't really know about like the ads for friendships. I only know about the ads for dating. <laughs> yeah, th I know of one. So uh, there's Bumble BFF, uh, which is like Bumble oh, no, right. Yeah, it's like the Bumble dating app, but it's for friends it's called Bumble BFF. I, I'm not sponsored, but I'll just put it out there. <laughs> um, before we close out, I wanted to ask one more question to both Robbie and Sky, And that is when, you know, you are talking to someone, whether it's through a dating app or texting, when do you tell them like, hey, by the way, um, like I'm in a wheelchair or, Hey, by the way, like when does that conversation happen? So for me, this is a great question, but for me, I think it um, varies on the person and the conversation I'm having. So I don't like to wait super long to tell them, but it's not usually, hi, my name's Sky and I have muscular dystrophy because I don't want that to become like, who they know me as, like there's many things about me and my life, but I don't like waiting super long. So I think there's, um, when, whenever you feel comfortable and whenever the conversation kind of, you can kind of like, uh, you know, when there's like a point in the conversation where it, it can mesh within, I would say that that's when I usually do it. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's a great question as well. I mean, it's one of those things that no matter what, it's going to come up, um, you know, and I, I can tell you for me, uh, when I started, you know, the online dating and everything, I just kind of decided to be kind of upfront. So I, most of my photos that I had, you know, I was in my, you know, wheelchair and honestly, most photos I take, obviously I'm in my wheelchair. Um, but my wife will tell you that the reason why she swiped right was because of what I said in my and tinder you can kind of put like a little bio or whatever and um she remembers it I, I can't totally remember but and you know I know this is like kind of funny or stupid or whatever but like it was like three things that I put and like one was like uh I love I love I'll love you like Kanye love loves Kanye and then it was like if you like long walks on the beach this probably won't work out um and also I'm not into hiking um and you know and and obviously it's all about comfortability but you, you definitely it's it's going to happen and it's better to be up front and 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 it can feel kind of defeating like that oh you know or am i going to get the same opportunity because i have a disability but at the end of the day you don't want to talk to somebody if they're not going to be okay with you you know being up front and and it, and the other thing too is i always used to kind of tell myself is like obviously it, you know, having a disability is a huge unknown for a lot of people, but it, at the end of the day, when you go on a dating app like Tinder or whatever, you know, you're, you're looking at like what you like and, you know, people we're allowed to like what we like, we're attracted to what we're attracted to. And that's just an aspect of you, you know, that's who, you know, a part of you. And sometimes people are going to like that. And sometimes people, they're not, and it, it just is what it is. But I mean, yeah, for me, I kind of chose just to be right up front with it because um, I felt like that was the best route. Um, but no matter what, the, the question still comes up. And 
then that's where I was always kind of open as far as why, you know, what was going on and things like that. And the other aspect too, is you always get asked, you know, those inappropriate questions. And that's always, that was always the first question I got asked whenever somebody would bring it up, but that's just, I'm sure Sky can probably relate. And some other people on this call can probably relate. Um, but that's also where, you know, you find your comfortability too. And, um, you know, you, and also the other thing I would say is, is be, be, uh, aware of like, you know, there's some weirdos out there who are interested in just people with disabilities. And if you meet somebody like that, just immediately don't worry about it. Don't talk to them. Don't let that discourage you. But that's just, you know, it is what it is. That's one other thing I don't think we really talked about, but there are people out there and, but that's anytime you online date and, um, you know, don't like just let it discourage you. But yeah, sorry, I kind of went on a tangent, but yeah, just be up. I, I was always up front. <clears throat> Thanks, Robbie, and thank you for keeping it PG. This is a webinar. <laughs> we have one more question that has come in, um, and I think Paige, you can probably answer it best. Um, the question is, my two children have MMD1 and have great difficulty making friends. They are gregarious and friendly, but their chronological age does not match their peers and have uh, learning challenges suggestions um and then they asked and they put in another comment that said uh their peers maturity is on a higher level so it's two ships passing in the night yeah for sure um okay thank you for asking a thoughtful question um and i i think what immediately comes to mind is just ensuring based on your children's situation, just ensuring that our expectations kind of match what they're capable of, which of course you as their parent would have a better sense of. So for example, in, in that circumstance, it might be totally fine that they end up forming connections with people who are cognitively and level-wise a bit more matched to where they are. Um, you might have to get a little creative with like, where to access social events that gives them access to some younger kids. Um, and I'm just making an assumption based on the brief description. I also think if they have learning challenges that are established already and diagnosed, um, there might be people on their team who can help can help direct you a little bit. For example, if they have an IEP through school, you know, can the school help you think about, okay, how can I strength, help them strengthen their social skills and um, connect with others who are at their level a little bit? Um, and I, I know you referenced two kids and I, I know we also know, you know, they're two very different kids too. Um, so what works for one might be different than what works for the other. Um, but yeah, I, I think definitely learning more like what is their level that is a good starting point for them to jump off on and then, um, yeah, making sure our expectations meet that. Ah, they're in their 20s. That helps too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a whole nother, thanks for adding that, um, yeah, thanks for adding that important detail too. That's a whole nother thing because depending on the setting they're in, I, I think, you know, that adds to the need to think about, you know, where where can they um, connect with with others? You know, I don't, if they're in their 20s, they're probably out of high school and things. So yeah, you'll have to th think more in the community too. Um, Thank you so much, Paige. We're going to um, end the Q&A there, and I'm going to share my screen one more time so that I can conclude the presentation. Thank you so much, Paige, uh, for sharing today. Um, we appreciate your time and expertise and everything you do for the neuromuscular community. I also wanted to thank Robbie and Skye for jumping on today and sharing your story and being open to answering questions about your experience. So thank you so much to the three of you. Thank you, thanks for having us. And thanks for the great questions from the audience. We will, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Does anybody have any last thoughts? Thank you guys, just thanks for having me.
Okay, we would love to hear your comments about this webinar. If you have a smartphone, open your camera and point it at the QR code on the screen. A web page will pop up with a short survey on today's webinar. If you do not have a smartphone, once the webinar is over, a screen will pop up with the survey as well. If anyone has any questions after this webinar, please feel free to email them to mdaengage at mdausa.org and we will follow back up with you. If you are new to MDA through this program and are diagnosed with one of our over 43 diseases under MDA's umbrella, or are a loved one of someone who is diagnosed, we encourage you to stay engaged with MDA. You can do this by visiting mda.org slash join and completing a short survey, a short form. This concludes today's MDA Engage webinar, Creating St Strong Connections and Relationships. Thank you very much for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.